Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you this beautiful Thursday, July the 27th. And I want to talk to you today about a topic that too many stray away from. We live by the tradition of what we've heard about this, and we don't understand the biblical view of this. And what we're going to talk about today is tithing. We're going to talk about the relationship between the freedom of tithing. So the relationship between freedom and tithing. Spiritual freedom that translates into every type of freedom. That's what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever given an infant a treat. Sometimes you go to the store and they pick up a treat and then you take it from them to open the package and they throw a fit. They throw a bitter, loud fit crying and carrying on because they cannot trust you. They don't have the capacity nor the experience as yet to trust that you're helping them enjoy this treat by removing the wrapper. And so they are overcome with anguish. And it's the same way we treat tithing. If we don't remove the wrapper from the infant's treat, what do they do? They chew the wrapper and the treat and that's no way to enjoy a treat so many of us see tithe in the same way we pitch a fit because God asks us for a tent or we think we're giving it to the church we think we're giving it to that pastor so we pitch a fit not yet having the capacity nor the ability nor the experience to understand that God is taking it to give it back to us in a more enjoyable way. To make our experience much more pleasant and bearable. Jesus said the abundant life. The first scripture we want to look at before we ask the Lord, before we do, let's ask the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the Lord. I know he's here because he promised. And he's a, not a man to lie. He keeps his promises. But I want him to more than just be here. It's like with Moses. I was reading today and it brought a tear to my eye. When Moses told God, God, if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to leave this place. And then he says, God, you said you've given me grace. And you said you know me by my name. Then would you show me your glory? And God lifted him up and put him in the cleft of the rock. And God said to him, you can't see my face. No one sees my face and live. He said, but I'll pass by. And I'll take my hand and I'll cover you. And when I pass you by, I'll release you and you'll see my back. And I never understood till today when Rick Joyner pointed out what Moses saw was the future of God's back when they would strip it. He saw a different kind of glory, the best kind of glory. The stripped back of Jesus by whose stripes we are healed, by whose blood we are redeemed, by whose name we become reconciled with God. We have sonship, by whose spirit we are sealed forever with Christ. And it brought a tear to my eye. And I was like, oh God, would that we understood your ways would that we understood your plans and your purposes 
And this is what God wants today for you to understand his glory in the aspect of tithing. Father, release your glory upon me that your spirit may rest upon me. Use my vocal cords. Use my thought process. Use me to speak to the hearers. Let your glory so fill their hearts and their minds that like Moses, they see your glory. Because just the back of you, oh, is worth the sight. So we just give you thanks today as you release your truth into the atmosphere and your word never returns void but it accomplishes what you will and it produces a harvest an abundant harvest before it returns back to you so we thank you today in the mighty precious name of Jesus and I decree over the hearers grace to hear grace to see for the fallowness of their hearts to be broken up and the truth to be impregnated, implanted in the reproductive system of their souls and their spirits, that they'll hear and see you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Ecclesiastes 10, 19 is where we want to start. Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says this, A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers all things. Patrick Henry, in his commentary about this verse, says, Wine makes merry, it makes glad the life. You could just see a person who took a glass of wine, two glasses of wine, They become so relaxed. They become so giggly. They become so happy. Wine makes merry. It says, and and a feast makes laughter. When we sit around the table and join a feast, we laugh, we talk, we enjoy ourselves. He says, but money, money is the measure of all things and answer all things. Pecuniae obedient omnia, money commands all things. The wine make merry, it will not be a house for us. It can't be a bed for us. It can't be clothing nor provision. It can't be portions for our children. Same with a feast. Feast makes our belly full, makes us make merry. But a feast cannot provide our needs. But money. Money can provide the feast. We need money to provide the feast, to make merry. And we need money to buy the wine to make our hearts glad. If men have enough, this is what Patrick, um, Matthew Henry says, if men have enough of money, it will be provision for all of these, the feast and the wine. The feast cannot be made without money. And though men have wine, they're not so much disposed to be merry unless they have money for the necessary. So money answers everything. Now, you've got to understand, money is not everything. Matthew Henry goes on to say, it will not procure, money will not procure pardon for sin, nor the favor of God, nor the peace of our conscience. The soul, as it is, is not redeemed by money. It's not maintained by money. It's not maintained with corruptible corruptible things as silver and gold. So you've got to understand, money answers everything, but it is not everything. And 
so what kind of relationship do we need with money? We need to understand this first. Psalm 50 verse 7. And God is speaking. And he says, hear my people and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even your God. And he says, and this is Psalm, Psalm 50 I'm reading. He says, I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings to have been continually before me. In other words, you're not doing what I've asked you to do. I'm not going to reprove you for it. I will take no bullock out of your house, nor he goats out of your fold. I'm not going to say, you're not giving me my offering like I told you to, so I'm going to go take it. No, I'm not going to do that, God is saying. He says, for every beast in the forest is mine. Listen to what God is saying. Every beast in the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. God says in verse 12 of Psalm 50, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. The, the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay your vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But unto the wicked, God says, what have I to do to the, what, I'm sorry, what have you to do to declare my statutes or that you should take my covenant in your mouth? Seeing that you hate instruction and you cast my words behind you. So God even had a word for the wicked. They don't care about the things of God. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he, God, founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So we need to start with the understanding. God doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't want our money. He doesn't want anything except our hearts, our hearts, and just like that infant can't trust that we are taking their little candy to peel the wrapper off, to give it back to them, and some people have the nerve to take a piece of it, which further puts that mistrust in that child, but not so God, not so God. He says in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first. Seek first. Listen, he is the king of the kingdom. He's the one who created everything. He's the one who created man and put man's ways, man's tendencies, man's proclivities, all that stuff. God is the one who knows it, knows it very well. God is the one who created us. So he says, this is what I want you to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Don't only seek his kingdom. Don't only stand holy and righteous and don't seek his righteousness. In other words, don't live a lie. Live his righteousness also. He says, in everything that you have need of, I will add it to you. And there comes the trust. In other words, God is saying, give me your treat and let me take the wrapper off and I'll give it back to you so you can enjoy it. 
that's Jesus saying. He further says in Matthew 6, 24 to 26, you can't serve God and mammon. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be so devoted to the one, he'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And what is mammon? It's mammonas, mammonas in Greek. And it's money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever that you value over God. It's the riches. It's treasure. So whatever you value before God, it's mammonas. It's a spirit. And you can't serve God and Mammonas. And that's what so many of us lack. And the thing is, we pass it through the family. Because we open door to spiritual demonic activity. And these spirits come into the home, come into the family. The spirits of lack. The spirits of addiction. Some people gamble. Some people do just wicked things to get money. They do scams. All kinds of stuff they do. They lie. They steal to get money. And what they do is open the door to demonic activity that passes through the family. And remember, when these demons come in, they do not come alone. So you look at your grandchildren and you wonder, why are they all homosexuals? What is going on? It's because of doors that have been opened to disobedience to God because you won't give God what is his so he can take care of it and give it back to you. It's like Jesus with the 5,000. I didn't plan to talk about this, but it is a good place I see to bring it in. He, the people were with him for three days and they were hungry and so it's time for them to go. And he says, give the people to eat and the disciples are like we don't have anything to give them to eat and even if we had money to buy for them all to eat there's not enough to give all these people to eat and and this is this is what jesus says what do you have and there was a little boy trust the children they're so childlike and that's what god says we have to be there comes a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And what did Jesus do? He took it. He lifted it up and he blessed it. And what did he do? He gave it back to the disciples and told them to give it to the people. He blessed it because they, the little boy gave it to him. Or the little boy brought it to the disciples. See, you bring it to church, to God's disciple. The disciple gave it to Christ. Christ blessed it, and then he gives it back. And he tells you, give it out to the people. And look how many was left over. Baskets were left over. Tithing. We need to understand the relationship between tithing and freedom now remember money answers everything it's just nature it's just a law and if you don't believe it I would like for you for the next three months not to pay your mortgage I would like for you for the next three months not to pay your electric bill don't pay your water bill I would like you for the next three months, don't pay your credit card. Just don't, don't do anything with that money. Put it in the bank if you want to. Go ahead and put it under the bed if you want to. And you watch and see what's going to happen. There will be more stress on you than the law allows. Because they will be giving you a foreclosure notice. They will be calling you. All kinds of stuff. Money answers everything. And if you don't pay the mortgage, 
if you don't pay the rent, they'll come knocking on your door. God knows that. He knows the hold that money has on us. He knows the fear that money brings to us. So he says, give me 10% of that money. And when you give me 10% of that money, I will unwrap it. I will open the windows of heaven and I will pour you out a blessing. How many of us obey that? And if we do, do we obey it like that infant throwing a fit because we're not <laughs> or do we do it and learn to decree and declare God this is what you said and I'm going to trust you let's move on where's the origin of tithing in the Bible did it people say it's the Old Testament it's the Old Testament law <laughs> it's not so it's not so the law came by Moses. We see the origin of tithing from the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned, what did God do? He clothed Adam and Eve with animals' skin. Where did they come from? Why did he do it? We see not only did he clothe them with animal skins, we see next. That Cain and Abel has an issue. And let's look at that part. Let's look at Cain and Abel. In, in Genesis 3.21, we see that unto Adam and his wife, the Lord made coats of skin and clothed them. And then we go on to Genesis 4.2. And we see Abel was born. And it says Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. But unto Cain... And to his offering, God had no respect. God had no respect for Cain's offering. Cain's offering was the fruit of the ground that he worked with his hands. Why wouldn't God accept it? Because it's obvious that God trained Adam and Eve about the offerings of blood. And that's where the animal was killed so they can have skins for their clothing. And they passed it on to their children, their first two children, Cain and Abel. So when it was time to offer to God, it says, Abel, Cain brought the fruit of the ground. God had no respect of his offering. And what it says in verse 5 of Genesis 4, Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And God said to him, why, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you've done the right thing, would there be need for this? Verse 8, Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So Cain killed his brother. He allowed that anger and that jealousy. And it all started because he didn't do what God asked. He did not give the tithe as God decreed, declared, set. So we see that happening from the beginning of time. And then we move forward to Abraham. And this is when God is going to pull out a group of people for himself. Why did he do it? So we can keep our eyes on them 
and see how God interacts with them so we can understand how God will interact with us. Not only that, out of this group of people, a seed would be born. Like he told them from the beginning in Genesis, the woman will bear a seed and that seed will crush the head of the enemy and the enemy will bruise his heel. So out of this group came Jesus. And so we see this pass it on to Abraham first. And let's look at that now. In Genesis chapter 14, we see that Abraham went out to war. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the king of peace, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And they set up a pillar, and it said, wait a minute, I, I skipped something. Verse four, um, Genesis fourteen twenty. He blessed. He blessed. He said, "Blessed be the Most High God, who has delivered your enemies into your hand." And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. Now it says here, he gave him tithes of all. And it seems a little confusing. Who gave who tithes? That was clarified in the New Testament. When we come down to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 7 retells the story. It said, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being, by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Here the description of Melchizedek. King of Salem, King of Peace, King of Righteousness, without father, without mother, without decent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, and abides a priest continually. We're seeing this is Jesus way back in the Old Testament that Abraham paid tithes to. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Okay, I'm going to go back to Genesis. We're seeing the origin of tithes. People say it's the law. It is not the law. It came since in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. We see it made clear with Abraham and Melchizedek. All right. And now let's look at somebody else. Let's look at Jacob. And in Genesis 28, verse 22, when Jacob saw the ladder, he got up and he set a stone as a pillar and he said, this shall be God's house. And he said, of all that you shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So 
here is Jacob affirming the tithes. Let's look at the now let's look at the law. The law in Leviticus twenty seven thirty one. And here is the tithes. Verse thirty. Le Leviticus twenty seven thirty. And all the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. And if a man will redeem his tithes, he shall add thereto a fifth part of it. So, back in the Bible days, it was an agricultural society where they grew plants, where they grew vegetables, corn, wheat, where they ra raised cattle, sheep. And so the tenth of everything was God's. And they had certain times of the year that they would bring their tithes to the Lord. And they had different kinds of offerings and tithes, different times of the year. And so God is saying, if they redeem it, for instance, if they were in a place where it was too far to take their tithes, their offering of of wheat and corn and oil and animals, it was too far. God said they could redeem it. In other words, they could sell it for something that they can carry to that place where God told them to go. But if they did that, they had to give a fifth instead of a tenth. If for any reason they used their tithes, for any reason, they had to give a fifth to pay back instead of a tenth. God asked for ten. The IRS in America asked for at least 15. In my case, over 20-something. Just ridiculous. But it is what it is. It is what it is. And, and there's so much teaching of the tithes, and we're not going to go through all of it. Tithes is apodekator in the Greek. And in the Hebrew, it's ma'asar. And it means to give a tenth. To give a tenth, a tithe of anything. People say, well, that's not New Testament. We can use all kinds of excuses, but it doesn't change the law. It doesn't. You know, some people drive around on their license plates. God said it. I believe it. That seals it. Mm -mm. Whether we believe it or not doesn't make a difference. God says it, and that's it. Period. Whether we believe it or not, it's up to us. But God said it. But God wants us to understand his love for us. When I saw today how God took his hand and lifted Moses and put him in a cleft of a rock and then covered Moses with his hand, his hand was that big, covered Moses with his hand, I just saw such a love, such a love for Moses. And that's what God has for us. We grew up in a traditional society where they point their fingers, especially my society, my culture. My culture is a shame-based culture. We were ruled by the English. And if you ever heard about the Scarlet Letter, it's about a woman who ended up having an affair with a priest. And when she got pregnant and they found out, they punished her by putting a huge red A on her chest. So she had to walk around with this huge red A, which meant adultery. What about the priest? He of all persons should have known better. But that's okay. God will get him. And so she was made to feel ashamed for what she did. And that's the kind of culture that I grew up in. They'll do things to make you ashamed. And so we get to the place where we would rather lie and hide than tell the truth because we didn't want... Who wants to be ashamed? Who wants to be made ashamed? And so 
we get to this place where we are so used to the culture, we don't understand. Once we become saved, we become new creatures. The old is passed away. The old is passed away. We become new. And now we need to start finding out what does this newness mean. The Bible tells us, put on the new man. Take off the old. We have to deliberately learn what God wants. His love, his great love and patience for us. We have grace all the way through until Jesus comes the second time. When he comes the second time, he's not coming as a lamb to redeem. He's coming as a king of kings, and he's coming with wrath. With wrath, because these 2,000 odd years, people have spat at his name, used his name as a curse word. They've laughed at his name. They've scorned him. They've stuck their middle fingers up at him. And now he's going to come as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and all those who have refused him will now deal with his wrath. And the grave is not going to hide them from his wrath. He will resurrect them and cast them in hell. So we have a choice right now. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we take that by faith. When we do that, his spirit, who's fully him, will come down and dwell with us and live with us and teach us what his manual means. So we become a new creature. And one of the things to set us free from the hold of the God of this world, from Mamomas, is tithing, releasing that thing into God's hand. All he asks is 10%, then he blesses the, ten, the 90, but then the blessings of the 10, he gives us back far more than 10. He opens the windows of heaven. I remember when we didn't have insurance, the tithe came in, my daughter never had a cavity. She never had a cavity. We didn't have insurance for a car. He covered us until, on the day we could afford insurance, he says, go get it now. He covered us because of the tithe. He covered us. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, and Luke 11, 42. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. We still have too many scribes and Pharisees right now. The scribes are the very learned religious people. The Pharisees are the religious leaders. They think they know it all. They, they so think they know it all that the very one that they're supposed to be proclaiming, they killed. <laughs> they killed him. They killed him, they called him Beelzebub, they called him a devil. So Jesus says, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. What does the Lord require of us? To love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with him. That's what he requires of us. He says, you ought to have done the tithing. You ought to have done these things, judgment, mercy, faith, and not leave the other, the tithing, undone. So your tithing is not just a legalistic act where you're stewing and upset. It's a trusting act. You want to trust that this God is a God who will do as he says. A God who will do what he says he will do. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. God help us. I'm going to I'm going to let you look. There's so much 
Hebrews chapter 7 is a deep chapter, but hopefully it will give you a better idea of what this means. Let's now go to the New Testament and look at some things. The first thing I want us to look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. And what does it say? It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty, might be rich. And don't let people tell you, ah, that's spiritual. You see, there's something called a Greek concordance. And with Google, you can find it easily. The only thing I want to warn you, I want to warn you severely, the artificial intelligence is now so astronomically advanced, but they're programmed by human beings. And a lot of those human beings hate God. A lot of those human beings don't even know they're serving Satan. So what they program those AIs with is things that will tell the lies about the Bible, lies about God. So I want to warn you, get the Bible in you quickly. Get this word of God in you. Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living. The word of God is God himself. And when you get this word of God in you, it's going to discern the evil, discern the lies. Get it in you quickly. So the Greek concordance will tell you what the original words mean as it was written in the beginning. Because the, the New Testament was re written in Greek. And so the Greek word for rich is pluteo. And it means to be rich, to have abundance of outward possessions, to be richly supplied, affluent in resources, so that you can give a blessing to others. He left his heavenly throne, gave up his riches, came to earth in a stable as a poor man, gave up his riches so we can exchange his blood, his life, his riches for our lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The only place in the Bible where God commands that we prove him, God challenges us to prove him, is Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, he says in verse 10, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. The storehouse is that place where all the riches of God is, where the man or the woman of God is feeding God's people with the riches of the Word of God. It's that church that you go to, that place that you go to. Notice he didn't say, send your tithes. He says, bring your tithes. There are some of you who do not have a church right now. And what God is doing, he's raising you up to be the church. So right in your house, you're going to gather a few people and y'all are going to study the meat, the truth of the word by the Holy Spirit. God is raising you up. And that's what this ministry is sanctioned to do. Raise up 12 ministers, at least in 12 countries, that will carry the richness of the gospel. And so some of you don't have a church right now because COVID, oh my goodness, like when the, 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 the man comes to exterminate our house. Ooh, sometimes every now and then you see one of them big cockroaches lying on their backs. Yes, COVID exterminated 
the rancid, exterminated all those who stand behind the pulpit claiming to be, and they were not. And some of you have found them out, and you cannot go back there. If you go back there, those spirits that they are serving, which is not of God, will come and live in you and your house and in your children. You cannot go back. Some of you is not because it's bad, but because you've been in kindergarten for too long. How long are you going to stay in kindergarten? It's time you go to first grade. It's time you go to college. Every church has an assignment. Some churches, they're operating on first grade level, kindergarten level. There's nothing wrong with them. That's what God has called them to do. And we've got a whole YouTube generation coming up that are criticizing the church. They criticize Joel Osteen. They criticize this person and that person. They criticize Joyce Myers. And not one of them has saved a duck compared to the amount of people that Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers and T.D. Jakes have touched. But they're human beings. They're not God. So we need to pray for them, not criticize them. So, what am I saying? God says, bring your tithes into the storehouse, into that place where the riches of my truth dwells, that there may be meat, the meat of the word may be in my house to feed the sheep. Listen, listen, there is coming a day and now is upon us. When you are not going to be able to stand against the diabolical evil without the word of God, without the sword of the spirit sanctioned by the spirit of the living God, you're not going to be able to stand. You need the meat of the word. And that's what God is raising up right now. So you bring your tithes to the storehouse, not send it. You bring it. That means you go there. You go there. For those of you, God is going to show you where to go or he's going to cause you to open up your house. I said it when COVID started that God is raising up house churches just like in the days of the Bible, God is raising up women like Lydia in the Bible, the woman of purple who supported Paul and the disciples. God is raising up children who are going to turn their backs on all the evil and they're going to stand for the truth like Daniel and Meshach and Abednego. It's happening. It's already happened. Don't let him pass you by because you're throwing a fit over a little bit of money that God doesn't want. And you know what? I am so happy to teach this because none of you, none of you except two, send tithes here and give to us. So we don't care what you think. We just want you to know the truth. We're not asking you for your money. We don't want your money. We want from God. And if God tells you to send to us and you don't, then you're acting like that infant throwing a fit. And God is going to love you. God is going to love you. But you can't stand against the wiles of the enemy the diabolical plans of the enemy. Listen, he's coming to houses and stealing husbands and turn them to sissies. He's coming for our boys and turn them to sissies. He's coming for our girls and turning them into men. And we have to, before he comes, stand at that door with the word of God and says, not fear, not on my watch, but you cannot do it without the word of God sanctioned by the spirit of God because it's the spirit of God that has the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage and every diabolical enemy that comes to your door. Amen? 
So he says in Malachi 3.10, bring all, not some. If you take some, redeem it. Some of you need to start all over today. Start over. Brand fresh. Repent for not giving the tithe and start fresh. Start fresh. Set it up like my daughter does. She has it come out of her paycheck. So she says, I don't see it. When I see my paycheck, my tide is already taken out. So I don't depend on that. I don't depend on the tides. It's gone to where it needs to go to. You have to be wise as, as serpents and harmless as doves. So he says, prove me. Prove me, God says. Prove me now. Prove me now with your tithes, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be no room to receive it. Somebody calls and says, they have a job for you. They created a job just for you. Yes, I know somebody. I'm not going to say who. I was just told this week, somebody told her in the office, you need to apply for this position because you're ready to move to that level. And she did apply for that level. This is a tither. This is a tither. And she says, the lady said to her, we cannot put you in for this position at the level of money that you're making right now. We have to do something about that first. So she had to do something to bring her money level up. She says, the money that you are making doesn't come anywhere close to the starting salary of this position that you are qualified for. So she did something to bring that thing to the place where now your salary is where it should be, go ahead and apply for that job. Imagine that. But that's what God does, man. That's what God does. That's what God does. And just because trials come, trials come, just like it did with Job, when the devil will say to God, they're only doing that. Because you give them everything. And God says, okay, go ahead and break their car down. And you see what's going to happen. They're still going to serve God. They're still going to serve God. They might feel some type of way. They might grumble. But they know God, God, Job said, though you slay me, yet will I trust. That's the kind of God that God we serve, and that's the kind of people God is building who can stand against the wiles of the enemy. Warriors, more than conquerors. He says, you prove me if I won't open the windows of heaven. The windows of heaven are already opened. They opened when Jesus came on the scene went into the baptism waters before he was sent by the Spirit to the wilderness. The waters, as he went into it, the heavens opened, and a voice said, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Hear him. And that's what we're doing right now. Don't hold on to 10% and cause... So much God has for you to be forfeited for 10%? What can 10? Look, sometimes things popped up on, on, on my computer and says 10% off. And I'd be like, 10%? Uh-uh. I'm not putting myself through all this trouble for 10%. What is 10%? No, I don't want no 10%. Give God 10%. 10% is nothing. Reminds me, 
Pastor John of the Rock Church told us a story one day. He said this young man would come and, you know, things weren't going good and Pastor John discipled him and prayed for him and he would pay his little tithes. I think he was getting a, he was paying a hundred dollars on tithes. And after a while, oh man, the tithes that he was required to pay was so much more. And he started grumbling. And he said to Pastor John, I got to pay all this money. And Pastor John said, that's okay. I'll pray for you that you'll go back to just paying a hundred. He got it. He said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Ten percent. Ten percent. Ten percent. Jesus, have mercy. God said, prove me. He said, not only will I open the windows of heaven for you, but I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, God has given us the authority by his blood and by his name and by his word and by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks you up to rebuke the devourer ourselves. But here he says, I'll do it for you. Let me do it. I'll do it. You know, like the enemy comes to your door when you were little. I don't know if you remember. I remember. And my brother will say, get out of the way. I'll take care of this. <laughs> one of the um, one of the kids today in the classroom, I guess he pulled his phone out and he was playing on his phone. And I didn't see. And one of the girls said, you've got your phone out. And I said, uh-oh, bring that phone to me because he was told the day before twice, put his phone away. So I took the phone. He was so mad at her. He said, I'm going to get my sister after you. <laughs> I'm telling you, our daddy will go after the devourer for us. He said, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. And that's why you see your car break down and you're a tither or this happened. You remind heaven. You remind yourself, God, you said you will not let the ground, my fruit be destroyed. You said it and I believe it. So do I see this happening? I choose to believe you. I choose to believe you, God. And I Stand on your truth. That's what faith is. It's standing in a place where we don't know what's going to happen, but we trust what God says. Faith. Faith comes by hearing with our hearts, by doing what God's word says. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, faith, believe in God pleases him it's the only thing he has pleasure in that his children believe him his children believe what he says he says bring the tithes into the storehouse bring the offerings into the storehouse he says improve me if i will not pour you out such a blessing there won't be room enough to receive it and i rebuke the devourer for you and you believe what your father says that's faith he said, I will reward those. He's, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We've got to change the way that we've been dealing with God. We've got to change the way that we've been relating to tithing. We've got to change the way that we're relating to Christianity. It's sad that so many of us don't have that relationship between a father and a child that shows us the kind of relationship that God wants with us. But the spirit of Elisha is returning the hearts of the children to the father and the hearts of the father to the children. So I want to encourage you today as I come down to the end of this message how do you show your love for Jesus? 
He said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He commanded you to give 10%. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. I love that. But here's the next part of it. And my father will love him. And we will come. You already have the Holy Spirit with you. But now because you're obeying God, he says the father and I will come. And we will make our living with you. Do you know what that means? Oh my goodness. You've got the powerhouse of the entire world living with you. Who can stand against you? That's what it says in Romans chapter 8. Who can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Not a death, nor anything. Verse 24, he that does not love me, does not keep my sayings. And the word which you hear, they're not my words, but the Father who sent me. He goes on to, to show a picture in Luke 16, 11. He says, if you're not faithful to the unrighteous mammon, who will commit your trust to the true riches? How can God commit? Some of you are asking for a million dollars. God, I want a million dollars. How is he supposed to give you a million dollars? When you can't even tie 10% on the 50 that he gave you. When you get a million, you said, I'll give you. No, you will not. Because you've developed the habit of serving yourself. You've developed your habit of giving to people so people will like you. You choose people over God. You choose yourself and your desires over God. And you will do it when you get a thousand, a million dollars. That's why so many lottery winners, when they win the lottery in three years, they're worse off than they were when they started out. Worse off than they were. He gives a parable in, I want to end with this, Matthew 25. He talks about, watch, listen to this, I'm going to end with this. Watch, watch therefore, because you do not know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. You do not know the day nor the hour the Son of Man comes. So he says, watch. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, his own I am talking to believers, God's own servants. I'm not talking to the people of the world. I'm talking to people who says they love God, they believe. I am a voice to the believer. He says he called his own servants and he delivered his goods unto them. He gives you breath. He gives you strength to get up and go to that job. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And then he took his journey. And that's where he is right now. He's taking a journey and he's coming soon. And he says, some of them gained more. But the person who received one, he dug the earth and hid the Lord's money. How many of you are hiding what God has given you and refuse to give it back to him so he can unwrap it for you. He says, and finally the Lord came back and you would have these servants give an account and he's coming back and you're going to have to stand before him. Every believer, the unbelievers will, we know that, we know they're going to hell, but I'm talking about you as a believer, you're going to have a white throne judgment where everything you've ever done will be passed through the fire. He's going to reckon with you. And the one who didn't believe, who acted like he did and didn't, here's what he said. He said, 
I know that you are the kind of person, you're a hard man, you reap what you don't sow, and you gather where you've not strawed. He's a master. He's supposed to send you out there to do it for him. That's why he's a master. He's paying you to do it. He says, I know you reap what you didn't sow. And I know that you have what you didn't straw. He said, so I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. No, I hid your talent in the earth. And so here it is now. And the Lord says, oh, so you wicked, slothful, lazy servant. You knew that I reaped where I sowed not, and you know I gather where I have not strawed. Therefore, you ought to have sent my money to the bank so that at least I will have interest when I came back. At least I would have had my money back and interest, you lazy, unwise, filthy servant. He says, take that talent away from him and give it to them who has. He says, for everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not shall even what he has be taken from him. And he says, he shall be cast into outer darkness. Don't think it's hard to do what God says. Let's develop a different relationship to God and the Bible. I am talking about tithes. And I'm not asking you for money. I'll never ask you for money. I just hope God doesn't tell me to ask you for money. As far as I'm concerned, it's not so. So I'm not telling you to send me. You send it where God tells you to. Give God your treat. Let him unwrap it for you. Stand patiently and expectantly expect to eat that delicious treat unwrapped let him do it for you stop fighting against him stop complaining about pastors who are not doing what they should do you're putting your mouth on god's man and god hates it just like god hates anybody criticizing you he doesn't like it don't criticize god's people pray for them let them be let god deal with it you do what god asks you to do what has God asked you to do? We need to understand the relationship between freedom, freedom to stand on God's truth, stand on God's word, and know that our change is coming. Know that whatever it is that we desire, he's put it in our heart, and it's coming. He's preparing us for it, but we got to start somewhere. Wouldn't you? I want to challenge you. Believe God. Believe God. Believe his prophets and live. Believe his word. Believe the prophecy of this book. The Bible talks about those who believe this prophecy of this book. This is God's truth. Tithing has nothing to do with the other man. It has to do with you. You tithe. Because God told you to. And do it with a cheerful heart. Ask him to give you that. Ask him to change you. Ask him to help you understand like Moses did. And he lifted Moses up and put him in the cleft of the rock. Oh, what a God. May he show you his back tonight. That he allowed them to do for you and me. May he show you like Thomas. Thomas says, I'll never believe unless you, unless I see the scars. May he show you his scars. 10% in exchange for what they did to him? That's priceless. 10%? 10% is nothing. 10% of a dollar is 10 cents. It's nothing. It's nothing. Let's obey God. And I challenge you. To see him open the windows of heaven, bring that husband back. He's coming back. Saved and filled with the Spirit. Oh, yes. Those sons are coming home, bearing their sheaves, 
Oh, yes. You keep doing what you're doing. Keep tithing, Lydia. Keep obeying God. Sometimes you look and you see people having so much money to do whatever. They're not tithing. They're not building treasures in heaven. See, when things come to us, we can say, send me, send me some of my money from the bank of heaven. Oh, yes, write a check from the bank of heaven and send it, God. Sell a couple of cattle on a thousand hill and send me the money because I'm a tither. I can confidently say, God, I am joint heirs with Christ. Romans chapter 8. Everything belongs to Christ. And we are joint heirs with Christ. So I can say confidently, God, this bill is due. And I have no idea where it's going to come from. So I'm trusting you. Sometimes I say, God, sell a couple cattle and send me the money because I need it today. However you do it, I trust you. Unwrap my treat and give it back to me. I'm expectantly waiting. Mm, I can't mm, I can't wait to taste my treat. I trust you to unwrap it and give it back to me. Amen. God bless you. Obey him. What's the use of being a Christian when you don't obey it? It's like the Americans today. They're not obeying the laws of America. They're not living like Americans. They're not living for what America stands for. And our country is in a mess. Let's turn things around. It starts with us. One person at a time. One home at a time. One family at a time. Amen. God bless you. Should he say the same? I'll speak with you Sunday. Woo! I'm excited. Get the word in you. Get the word in you quickly before they bring lies. Amen. Love you, Lydia.